Aloha and welcome. Welcome to Think uh, Tech Global Connection Show. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, and uh, it gives me great pleasure today to bring back a guest who's been on our show before, a dear friend, Patrick Tijana Bronco. Patrick Bronco is a state representative of this 50, uh, representing Hailua and Kaneohe Bay in the Hawaii State uh, House of Representatives. And uh, more than that, he's a public servant who's been many years in, the, in government prior to joining the recently the state legislature. He's served many years in the Foreign Service, the U.S. Foreign Service, as a diplomat. Uh, and so today we've got a great opportunity to kind of reflect on some of that. And now also as you bring closure to your first session there. Uh, but let me first just welcome you, Patrick. Uh, thank you so much for joining us again here on Global Connections. Great to see you. Great to see you too, Dr. Horace. Thank you for always having me on the show. Well, and, you know, as I was reflecting, because uh, you've had opportunities, uh, particularly, you know, right now, uh, maybe uh, allow you to give us a final snapshot of, of, of how things ended. But I'm particularly eager to, to have you kind of step back. And, and, and now that you've had uh, you know, more experience with state and local government, you're also handling a lot of complex emergencies and issues. I mean, government is obviously putting out fires, uh, resolving challenges. Um, but your prior experience, particularly in the international arena, was managing some pretty tough spots, as we'll see in a moment, uh, places like Bogota, Colombia, Islamabad, Pakistan, uh, Caracas, Venezuela. I mean, these are, you know, some challenging uh, posts that you had recently, and even Washington, D.C., the operations center there. But first, just a, a reminder for some of our guests. I know uh, uh, we're familiar with you, but uh, one of the great things is that you're one of our local boys who's really gone on to kind of take on a, a real global uh, experience, uh, particularly in the diplomatic service. You're a graduate of the Kamehameha Schools, of course. And then you came out of Hawaii Pacific University years ago, where I had a chance to meet you there in a former life myself, uh, but gone on to the prestigious Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies uh, as a Wrangell Fellow. And, and that, of course, is what helped bring you into a path into the Foreign Service, uh, the diplomatic career. Um, a couple of years back, you, you, you took a break and, and have now joined us here back in Hawaii. I shouldn't say a break. You, you sort of had a, a new life chapter that's brought you back here. But let me, before we jump into some of these complex emergencies you've dealt with in the past, uh, maybe a quick thought on, on how you've managed to bring closure to your experience here back in Hawaii, state and local government, and, uh, you know, any either insights or lessons that you can draw from that diplomatic experience. Uh, no, absolutely. I think one of the, the foremost things during a crisis is always communication. And so that's been one of the key things, whether it was during the pandemic when I was running for office or when I currently as a state legislature legislator, it was always uh, keeping our community abreast. And so one of the things that I did while I was running for office was whenever the new guidelines came down about COVID or whenever Governor Ige signed a new proclamation, you know, one of my jobs when I was with the Secretary of State was to distill complex issues, a lot of information into 30 second, 90 minute briefs for the secretary. And so I essentially took that type of skill set and did the same exact thing with these emergency proclamations. So every week or so, we were mailing out to the community, letting them know, hey, this is the new update. This is happening with restaurants. This is happening with the mask mandate. And I felt that was really my value added. And when I got elected, we continued that in. You know, we're the only state representative office that actually sends out a weekly newsletter every Tuesday. And it's not about, you know, kind of like what I'm doing politically. It's actually what's happening in the community, you know, what's happening in our government, the key points that you need to, you know, live your life as a citizen. And I think that's the number one thing to emphasize in uh, in a crisis is very clear, concise, accurate information. Yeah, no, very well said. And I think one of the things we often don't appreciate is, you know, in a job like you've got today as a state rep or as a diplomat, you know, representing interests abroad, um, you've got to also have the ability to understand who your audience is because you're dealing with many of these, you know, often, you know, very high level people, very intense, you know, leadership making quick decisions. You may have to convey that to people who are, again, in many different, you know, disparate places, or even your constituents today, different types, and your ability to kind of convey this complex issue in a way that's understandable, that you know, that you've gained their trust and respect, uh, and of course, doing that in a foreign context adds other dimensions. Here in Hawaii, of course, we have this rich diversity, and, and that is something we always cherish. But it also means you might have to approach uh, your communication skills in different ways, right? And uh, what I'm, I'd like us to, you know, and we'll. Keep coming back uh, again, weaving in your insights from from your more recent state experience. But obviously, uh, the opportunity you had in the foreign service as a U.S. diplomat uh, initially, I'll never forget you. You had been a student of Korea and Asian studies, and you know where does Uncle Sam send you on your first duty down to South America, Bogota, Colombia? Uh, and you know it's a it's a of course it's gone through a lot of you know ups and downs and, and a history of political violence. But 
more broadly, it is certainly a you know a high security place and 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 uh, you know just day to day activities because you know even though it's had you know recent peace agreements and 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 whatnot, nevertheless uh, it, it remains a challenging environment. In a different way, neighboring Venezuela, where you would return later, right to Caracas, and and I'm just thinking in these kind of places as well. You were in very much a hot spot, Islamabad, Pakistan. You know places mm -hmm. where again, even just moving around to take care of your day to day activities has a very high security element. But I'd like to get to back to this question of communication because today, of course, we live in an age of social media, and you know you cannot function. And when you're dealing with an embassy that is abroad, you really have the U.S. government all there in one community. But you're conveying information not only to the Americans there. Obviously, one of the priorities is the American interest, protecting citizens, et cetera. But as you're dealing with emergency situations, you're going to be dealing with a lot of others, you know, locals and, and, and the like. So the communication takes on many dimensions. And I know, I think in one of those posts, if I'm not mistaken, I recall maybe it was in Venezuela where you were, or perhaps it was the Colombia when you were directly involved with a lot of the you know, communication, social media, outreach to the community. And I mean, just to share some reflections on that, because again, I think of like Hawaii, in many ways, we have this diversity, which means like the same thing may not work with one community as with another. I don't know. How do yeah, you absolutely. I can, I can touch a little bit on that. So my mm -hmm. first uh, position was actually as the deputy press attache at Embassy Bogota. Yeah. And, you know, one of the main things there, I covered um, non-traditional um, media, so social media, and then also mm -hmm. digital. But yeah. overall, whether it was traditional media and non-traditional, it was very important for us to always speak with one voice, especially as a U.S. embassy, right? And so what was very critical for us was, you know, our leader there is the U.S. ambassador. And mm -hmm. so even though I was one of the spokespeople, we always made sure that the ambassador was the voice, the ambassador was yeah. always the face. So they always had one voice. The other thing, too, was what was important in Embassy Bogota is one of the largest diplomatic missions in the world for the United mm -hmm. States. Yeah. It was also critical because we had 44 federal agencies. We also needed to be all speaking with one voice, right? Whether it was the IRS or it was DEA or State Department or USAID, it needed to make yeah. sure that we were talking with one voice. So our social media platforms were actually all coordinated across the embassy. It was yeah. only one. It was um, La Embajada Bogota, you know, like Estados Unidos, right? It was always one yeah. voice that we always had. That was very critical. For us to make sure that we were talking with that clear, concise voice, and also to build that um, re that repertoire, that rapport with the community, so they knew that this was accurate information coming from the U.S. Embassy, and it's very official. So that was yeah, one key. Yeah. And I just want to touch one story quickly. Mm -hmm. So it actually, my first week when I arrived in Bogota, um, Friday night, uh, my first Friday night, I received a phone call on my landline um, from actually the deputy ambassador, the DCM, the deputy chief of mission. And he had let us let me know that we had a U.S. citizen that went into the forest to go find tigers. Um, there are no tigers in, in Bogota or in Colombia. And uh, he got captured by the FARC. And the New York Times is on the line ready to speak to you. And so, of course, crisis Welcome. communication immediately came in. It was my, my, I was a junior officer. It was my first tour. So what I immediately did was I took the call and I just asked mm -hmm. the New York Times, you know, I just need a few moments, right? Because, you know, I, I needed to assess the situation. Mm -hmm. And what I immediately it, uh, did was I actually called my supervisor, who was actually vacationing in Miami. And so I was duty at the time. So that's why I got the call. But mm -hmm. also my second call was also to our local staff. And that was really critical in the embassy was always to lean on our, our local staff. So our local Colombian staff in the embassy, because they understood the context. They went through. Um, what was prior. So I think that's one thing to emphasize whenever you're in a crisis or a communication crisis, always go to the source who has that institutional knowledge. Yeah. And that was our local staff. And they Absolutely. were able to coach me through um, what I needed to do. And then the next morning at 7 a.m., we had a country team. So basically the ambassador leads the country team with 44 department heads. And I was able to present a press plan because I knew to lean on our, on our local staff. And yeah. so that, that's very critical to you know, lean on those who have expertise and lean on those who have institutional knowledge. Yeah, no, I think you put it very well and what you underscore is people don't always appreciate a, a U.S. embassy and, and particularly a substantial one. And Bogota happens to be larger for many reasons, security dimensions, but there's so much cooperation that goes on, agricultural, trade and the like. But at the end of the day, what you have in these substantial embassies is really the whole of government all represented there. And that can present challenges if you've got everybody putting out their, you know, their social media and the like. So very critical, a very strategic focus, you know, here's the same message and, and driving it home. 
Uh, and, you know, you also underscore, we have this, obviously, these embassies exist because they help us carry out our affairs, you know, both relations with the country, the host country, but also helping address, you know, American citizens and, and their needs. Uh, you've got a, suddenly an American citizen that, you know, needs help. And one of the challenges in, 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 in you know, in, in these difficult places is you find yourself having to often negotiate or talk to people of all types, you know, different kinds and different levels and, and the like. Uh, you referred to the local staff, again, uh, an appreciation of you've got a lot of people who have tremendous continuity, institutional knowledge, often they are local nationals that we will hire any part of the world because at the end of the day, you can't, you can't depend exclusively on just your own. And, and those become very trusted, I guess, uh, part of the staff. I think of it very similar, let's say, in, in your career uh, now as a legislator. You've got career civil servants who understand the lay of the land, have been there, they kind of continue regardless of who might be at the top. The political leadership often changes and comes and goes. Now you have a need for those skills, uh, you know, the thinking and the strategic vision, but you also need people who can implement. And one thing we know about bureaucracies and organization theories, if you don't have the clear either buy-in or, or, you know, understanding of, of how uh, how things are going to be implemented, or like you suggested, you know, knowing the lay of the land uh, from your, from your your local staff, that becomes so critical. Um, well, uh, again, uh, the other thought I had was, you know, as you Think about these complex emergencies. I mean, it requires a lot of different skill sets, and you know, many of us have some of them. Some people have more than others. Uh, in general, we might think of, especially operating in a foreign environment, you need very important uh, intercultural uh, effectiveness skills, and that means dealing with, you know, again, foreign environments, different cultures, different rules of the game. You know, we often take for granted uh, in the U.S. that things work a certain way. Even among our states, there's variation. But when you're in another foreign setting, it's a very real challenge. I mean, maybe uh, any anecdotes or examples from you know ways things are done so differently that you have to adapt, and you have uh, adaptation skills are so critical. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, whether it was in Colombia, Venezuela, or Pakistan, even just entering, you know, each country was very different, right? Because of definitely the, the the security standards that the U.S. embassy had, or also the country put in place. So it was also very important not to play with those rules or to try to, you know go around those rules. And so it was very critical. I remember in Pakistan, you know, there's still, there was selective zones that we had to be in. And, you know, some members would go outside of those zones and they would think, you know, you know, it's safe or whatnot, but there are real threats out there. And so, of course, that's another thing with, with crisis is also, you know, follow the rules. And that, that's the basic thing I could say yeah. is like, yeah, yeah. you need to make sure. And yeah, especially when it came to the embassy, our regional security officers, they understood the lay of the land and understood what real threats were out there, especially mm -hmm. when I was in Colombia the first time, you know, capturing a U.S. diplomat was a prime target if they could get us in, in Bogota, Colombia, right? And so when I was in Bogota the first time, we weren't allowed to drive outside of the city, city limits, because, you know, outside of that limit, there was, uh, it was, it was insecure. And so that was really important for us uh, to emphasize and um, whether it was in, in Venezuela also, we had those same type of restrictions, um, the same type of places we could go. Um, even though in Venezuela it was a, a very unique situation, right? Uh, we had a food crisis. So if someone said there was eggs, right? You knew that that specific zone there where there was eggs, you weren't allowed to go. And sometimes you just couldn't get eggs, you couldn't get milk, but that was the situation um, because it becomes really critical. And I also wanna, from being outside in the field, you know, you have a different point of view, but coming back to Washington and when I was in the operations center, right, you could see how extensive those types of decisions on the ground diplomats were actually affecting us in the operations center. And so it was really good for me to get both of those perspectives yeah, to make sure that we were following those rules. Because if something happened to a U.S. diplomat in Latin America or in China or whatnot, you know, it came up to, through the totem pole and it basically set the alarms for the entire building at State Department, and then we all had to kind of have a full response. And so it was very difficult too when there was someone who just didn't follow the rules or follow the regulation. Yeah, no, very well said. And, uh, you know, again, and, uh, you know, these are skills that, you know, on one hand, you do learn them, you, you, you get, you know, introduced to them. And, and obviously as a diplomat, you're trained to have some understanding of the host country and culture you're dealing with, the language, uh, you know, and yet until you're there and on the ground, a lot of it is more, informal, your own relationship development, you know, building, you know, ties with people once you're there, very different from your first day arriving, suddenly, you know, six, nine, 12 months later, you've now got a, you know, a different set of relationships. Now, one of the things that maybe, 
you know, kind of like the teacher in me is always bringing it back to what are some of the, I guess, the skills and competencies that you either need or you develop uh, for that kind of thing. And, 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 and again, what I find fascinating is that while you can, we can speak about it right now in, in, in a foreign context, there are also complex issues that we deal with at home, or, or maybe to put it differently, we often think of conflict. And today, I, 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 in many ways, I was struck by uh, your own experience. I can imagine in Eastern Europe today, given the crisis in Ukraine, uh, our embassies in, in places like Warsaw and in, in, you know, neighboring uh, Romania, uh, even something like the U.S. consulate in Krakow, Poland, which is near the border, today are dealing with just a, you know, a very, very you know, dynamic, rapidly changing environment, you know, refugee crisis money pouring in material, uh, delegations of, you know, members of Congress and whoever or not, it is just a, a flurry of activity. Um, and it, and it, it has a way of, in some ways, sucking out the air and energy out of other things. Again, um, complex emergencies happen, you know, in many places. Sometimes they're short term, periodic, you get over it, you move forward. Uh, you described Colombia. I had uh, myself the privilege of living there 30 years ago, early 90s. It's a pretty tough time as well. But even in the time I was traveling, there were times where it got more relaxed, it was like a truth. Other times where it obviously heated up and you had to be very careful. Um, but let me get back to this other part. Again, uh, part of the crisis communication that you describe, uh, um, you know, today uh, we live in an interesting world. And so yeah, a diplomat today must be connected to the social media and, and, and monitoring it and being aware because a lot of the dialogue is happening there just as it does here. Um, and, uh, you know, from your experience and in, you know, whether it's in the field, these places you serve, you were also back in Washington and with the operations center where you're obviously receiving, you know, all the input that's happening in the field. Uh, and yet I can just imagine, you know, the old timer means, well, in the old days we would read a newspaper, we would follow some wire services. Now there's just so much information. And how do you find it? How do you get on? Because a lot of it, a lot of it is going to be clustered in little, you know, uh, I guess what you might call them bubbles or silos, right? But we need to understand, we need to, you know, to monitor that. And not only that, but even as you convey the information, you, you describe sort of the one, you know, the importance of, let's say, a clear single message. And yet there are so many different outlets. I mean, is it the same thing everywhere or do you have to find ways to tailor it, adjust it? Uh, I don't know, uh, just uh, if you can yeah. share a little more about the, the different types of uh, communication and, you know, and communicating maybe, you know, about an emergency, it might be different, again, in a different cultural setting or to different generational groups that you're trying to inform. Well, the other thing with, um, you know, to prepare yourself for any crisis is also the relationship building, right? Yeah. And so I think that's really important too, especially when you're in, in a foreign country, is to make sure you have good connections with, with journalists, you know, with uh, not the top level of every bureaucracy or department, but also kind of having the mid-level or kind of yeah. the upper management. So you can kind of get more insight when you see kind of a crisis brewing that's really important as well. So whenever I went to a new embassy, it was very important to have those initial courtesy calls with the, the you know, the key journalists in the country, the, the key uh, ministers in the country, the key political leaders, because that's how you were able to get information. The other thing too, which was important when, when I was managing, um, you know, some people would like to just repost tweets or from a newspaper or whatnot, for me, I would never do that because I think, you know, it shows a bias to certain publications, but it's important to, you know, glean that information and make those tweets your own. The other thing too, for us, we, what we were very fortunate is that we also had the backup of the Department of DC. So this actually happened when we were going into evacuation in Venezuela, it was important to us to reach back to our DC colleagues. And so when we were evacuating, they were able to take over our, our various uh, social media outlets, our, our various outlets, so they could back us up. But they were only able to do that because it's also with the information we give them. So it's very important to have that communication, especially for us, um, you know, State Department's a very complex agency to make sure that that communication between the agency and also um, back at post was really important as well. Mm -hmm. And the other thing too is going back to your point about uh, like, um, you know, cultural sensitivity, it was really important too, whenever you're in crisis, to, to understand the cultural sensitivities when you're going. So like for in, in, for in Pakistan, I, I just knew when, you know, I managed a large team of 45 and I had some women on the team and, you know, here in Hawaii, you know, we greet with, with, with a hug or those types of things, but it was really important for us to understand the rules and boundaries as well mm -hmm. when it came uh, to the Islamic culture, which was really important for us to know. So that's the other thing is you should become very familiar 
with the host country culture um, because you don't want to make those fumbles when you're dealing in dealing with a crisis. Yeah, yeah. No, actually, and well put. So you need you need obviously a clear understanding of that host country culture and 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 a respect for it, and maybe more generally an attitude of modesty and respect that goes both ways. Because one of the challenges for the U.S. You have a long history and a sort of a personality trait as being the big bully. We tend to be large, and when we arrive, you know, and, and even the negotiating style that's you know typical of particularly the American businessman or even you know the negotiator, kind of come in, shake hands, make a deal, you know, get the thing, you know, get things done. And many many places where that just doesn't work, you've got to build that relationship first. You have to, you know, you have to have many meals and many you know developing those ties. But more broadly, um, I think. Again, one of these competencies that I think you develop very well in, in, in this type of crisis uh, environment is you need to demonstrate modesty, not only about your own culture, but a respect for the ways in which the local culture itself uh, is approaching things. They may have a different understanding or a different knowledge of the local context. So you need that kind of, in some ways, uh, I don't know if it's a good listening ability or, 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 or modesty that comes in. And I mean, you yourself spent many years in the foreign service where you also saw it at a time where suddenly the U.S. and its leadership was being challenged. We had a president who came to power that obviously was was white, you know, contentious, controversial, and many were, uh, you know, questioning the U.S. leadership role. Uh, and, and you know, even fair to say, a lot of credibility was lost in, in in some of our relations. Well, all that to say, here we are now. We're coming back, and you know, we're now dealing with a major crisis in Europe. That obviously the U.S. is taking a leadership role, bringing together you know many allies and the like. But you can never take away this reality that the U.S. is just so big and powerful. But as a diplomat, you then have to also balance that with, you know, if you're going to gain the trust and you want to work effectively with people in the environment, you need a certain degree of or a certain attitude of modesty and, and respect. Uh, what, what, yeah, what and I was actually going to say, you know, I think I was uh, more successful in the sense because uh, of my upbringing in Hawaii, you know, you were uniquely positioned in the in in the Pacific where we understand a lot of culture, yeah. um, and we experience a lot of different cultures here. And so, I think very pervasive in our culture is to listen first and talk less, right? And so that's kind of the mentality I took during my diplomatic career as well. And uh, you know, I had my my ambassador, and he would jokingly kind of just, uh, you know, we had forty four agencies. I was his special assistant, so my job was to kind of coordinate. And he would always say, hey, Patrick, uh, go do your Hawaiian thing, because he realized that the way I approach, you know, with modesty and humility and my you know, non-threatening style, I was able to get a lot of our employee, you know, our employees, our teammates to get on board a lot quicker. And I think Hawaii really set me up. And this is why I always tell um, young people, I actually spoke to an elementary class this morning and I said, you know, do you know what a diplomat is? And they didn't. And I shared with them and I said, you know, you are already prepared to become a U.S. diplomat because of our unique cultural upbringing here in Hawaii. And so I'm, as always, I'm encouraging folks to reach out to myself or reach out to the diplomat in residence um, in the, you know, the Western region. And I do believe you have one at the East West Center yeah. as well that can That's speak right. to young people about joining the Foreign Service because Hawaii has those unique qualities that really position us well to be very successful diplomats. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I mean, those are qualities, again, there are many of them, uh, what I often call the sort of the, inter, the interculturally effective person. Uh, and, you know, like you described, growing up here, you're, you're managing and balancing these different sort of, you know, social relations, if you will, in a way uh, that's very different from those who grow up in other parts, often where it's either much more homogeneous, or maybe it's, a, you know, in, in parts of the U.S. where it can be largely a black and white or increasingly brown. I mean, here we really are truly a, a, a melting pot of uh, different, but, but they play out in different ways, right? And it's both understanding the concept of culture, uh, but having this attitude of modesty and respect that we describe. And yet that same attitude sometimes can be seen as too either pusillanimous or you know, not, not, a, not assertive enough or not you know, clear. But at the end of the day, a lot of it is about building trust, right? And, and that can only come from, from having a, a mutual respect and, and showcasing that. So I think you put it well, uh, students uh, or you know, somebody growing up in Hawaii kind of already has some of those skills of, that are quite crucial for inter, well, intercultural effect. Um, I wonder, you know, as, as you think back now, um, you know, again, we've, we've done this a few times, but that experience that you've had clearly put you on the hot spot in many places, but it, 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 as you're coming back now, you're dealing with a different kind of government. Uh, and, and it's back to this overall question, you know, uh, 
the, the federal government that you're you know representing abroad as a diplomat is complex and, and diverse state and local government is right here i mean it's same but different i mean as you finish maybe some final reflections what are some lessons takeaways in terms of what is similar and we've talked a little bit about that and what might be very different uh, because on the other hand and, and maybe let me finish it with this anecdote we often hear the phrase you know we want to think globally because the world is you know interdependent connected and we, we need to be aware but ultimately we're all here in our communities and we need to act and understand locally uh, so just on that any final reflections on you know your your own experience developing intercultural effectiveness sure i think the first thing of course i i see a similarity between whether i was in colombia or venezuela to hawaii is um, you know, here in Hawaii, politics are all relational, right? And so that was really key is to building those relations, um, you know, with your colleagues, whether they're from Puna or Kaimoki or from Hanalei, it's very important uh, to, to make, build those relationships. The other thing too that I learned uh, as well, which I, I developed at the embassy is email's great, but face-to-face -face is even better. And so if I was able to, you know, have that communication walk down the hall, and you know, I'm known for this in the state house is, you know, I will never send an email I can, if I can avoid it and I'll walk over and talk to you about the issue because you can understand what someone is trying to convey or the tone that they're trying to convey when you're meeting person to person. And so that's, that's really critical for me, especially also as, as you know, a builder of teams to have that personal kind of, of, of relationship building is, is so critical. Um, the other thing too, um, as people always kind of say, government is slow, so you have to remember that, but there are ways to be effective. And when you build those relationships and you know the person who is at the DMV office or the person that you know in the Department of Planning, and you can go and kind of, you know, not call them for to do something, but call them to ask to explain a situation. I think that's the best way to approach it as well. And so that's really critical. So I, I can not emphasize enough the importance of relationship building. Excellent. No, well, very well said. And on that, we can close this ongoing conversation. I think, uh, especially as we're coming out of this pandemic now, it, it reinforces the need that we need to get back to more people to people in person exchanges. We're still doing our Zoom here for now, but one of these days soon, we'll, we'll have an in person one, of course. So, Patrick, let me thank you again. Uh, it's been really great. Uh, and of course, I see you as a really a, a public servant of really a, of the very important kind of like a polymath, somebody who understands obviously the big complex global issues, but it also has your, you know, very much immersed in, in local issues that are at the end of the day, what matter. And uh, so I uh, didn't mention, but of course, uh, you, your own path uh, may be continuing as, as you've launched now a candidacy for the uh, congressional district uh, here that's opened up now. And so wishing you all the best with that. I know uh, we'll look forward to some ongoing dialogue as, as we have opportunities again. I, I want to thank you for joining us here again on Global Connections, Patrick. And Always a pleasure to reconnect and thank you for your insight. Aloha. Aloha, thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.